In March 2024, the corporation Canva acquired Affinity Photo. And ever since that time, there has been concern that Affinity Photo would be switched to a subscription program. And many persons, myself included, fully intended to drop Affinity Photo as a photo editor if that were the case. For many of us, we switched from Photoshop because they went to a subscription method. Let me take a moment to explain to you what a subscription method is. It is a way to screw you over till the end of time. And that's not just personal opinion either. Long ago, in a course on an investment history, the professor was discussing how stocks from companies that had low profit margins but pretty much guaranteed repeated sales were better investment choices than stocks that perhaps had high profit margins but one-time sales, or at least a long time between sales. For example, companies like Gillette, which made razors, which people use all the time, were much better and more reliable investments than, say, stocks in a tool-making company where persons might buy those tools only once in a lifetime. And subscription models essentially build on that, except they don't build on it honestly. In other words, your razors from Gillette legitimately wear out every few weeks and you need to replace them. Unless, like me, you shave with a straight razor, in which case your great-great-grandkids could inherit those razors. But that's another story. But many subscription companies offer products which could legitimately be bought. But instead, they are sold on a subscription basis because it guarantees a customer base, keeps them coming back, and essentially keeps them paying forever. And because I understand this, I was never going to stick with Affinity if Canva had switched it to a subscription model. I would absolutely have changed software probably to GIMP, which I know GIMP can be made to work about as well as Affinity Photo. I don't use it because I know Affinity backward and forward. I've been using it since there was an Affinity Photo, but I would have switched in that case. However, Canva gave the world a full functioning Affinity Photo for free. They changed the name to Affinity and it now offers all the Affinity features such as Affinity Publisher. They offer you a subscription to their additional services such as their AI for photo editing but you're not required to take it. This was something that the makers of Affinity Photo had promised that Affinity would never switch to a subscription model and it appears at least at this time that they kept their promise. The name of Affinity Photo has been changed to Affinity and as soon as version three, the new version came out, I promptly downloaded it. And let me tell you, it is the real deal. Affinity offers all the features of Affinity Photo plus all the features of Affinity Publisher, which I have. They are not in any way handicapped, and in fact, they are markedly improved. And today, I'm going to demonstrate some of the key ways that they have been improved. I have to say, I am genuinely impressed. As far as I am concerned, Affinity is now the single best photo and astrophoto editing tool on the market. It doesn't do everything. I would still use another tool for stacking photos. Affinity has a stacker, but to be honest, it's not great. And unfortunately, only Noise Exterminator runs in Affinity at this time. But its power to do layer-based photo editing on astrophotography, color balance, sharpen, and make specific edits and corrections is, is just unrivaled. I used to do the final 10% of editing or so in Photolab to compensate for Affinity Photo 2's own weaknesses in color and light management, but that's barely necessary anymore. I get a very slight benefit from a little final editing in Photolab 8, but I've gone from needing it, say, 10% to needing it 2%. Let's jump in and I'll show you. I've opened the new Affinity and I'm going to drag in the masters from a fairly complex set of data, including luminance, red, green, and blue, and H-alpha information. The first master is the red, green, and blue information, which has been pre-combined in PixInsight. I could easily combine them in Affinity Photo, but it's a little simpler in PixInsight. Bringing in the RGB master first establishes the color space of the image. This information portrays a high focal length fragment of the California nebula, revealing the complex structure contained within the nebula. Now I'm going to bring in the luminance plate. I'm going to use affinity to align them right down to the pixel. The snap tool will take care of the final alignment, making it exact. And then, as per my standard procedure, I'm going to composite the luminance plate onto the RGB plate below. Compositing adds the information from the luminance plate to the RGB information. And the goal is to retain the information from both plates while finding a composite method that portrays the data in the best way possible. Usually, the best way to composite luminance information to RGB information is with the luminance composite mode, though there are exceptions. To find the best composite mode, I just scroll right down through them like you see me doing here. 
And Affinity Photo, being a live editor, shows you what each outcome would look like before it's even applied. And this is one of the reasons, one of many reasons, that I do not edit my Astro Photos and Pix Insight. In Affinity Photo, I don't need to bother with nonsense like preview windows, and I especially don't have to bother with applying changes to an image, seeing if I like them, then going back and undoing them and applying others and slowly trying to work toward the best edit possible. That would take forever, honestly, to reach the very best effort doing it that way. In Affinity Photo, I can see as I work what is going to provide the best outcome. In this particular case, as expected, the luminosity composite mode provides the best outcome. It transfers all the light and shadow information and all the high frequency information where the detail is found very well into the RGB information, combining both into this image. Just as I would in the previous Affinity Photo, once I've selected the composite mode that I'll use to apply the luminance information to the RGB information, I'll then right click on one of the layers and select Merge Visible to merge all their information together into a new layer, and I'll dub it LRGB. Now, I'm going to drag the H-alpha plates into the image, align it just like I did previously, and then find the best composite method to blend the H-alpha plates information into the LRGB information. One thing I noticed immediately while scrolling through the various composite methods is how quickly and smoothly the results of each composite method are portrayed. With the old Affinity Photo, there could sometimes be a delay. It got accurate results, but there could be a slight delay between the demonstration of one composite method versus the next. But in Affinity Photo, the application is quick and smooth. I've also noticed I get a lot less crashes. I had Affinity Photo 2 set to back up every minute, and I would frequently hit Control S to save, just to save whatever progress I was working on every few minutes. It just did it out of habit. But I have so far edited four sets of astrophotography information with the new Affinity, and in that time, I have only experienced two crashes, and in those cases, I was able to trace that back to a driver incompatibility. The new Affinity wanted to work with the latest NVIDIA driver, and ever since downloading it, I haven't had another crash. It is also recommended that in Affinity Photo, you turn off GPU acceleration. If anything is going to lead to a crash, for some reason it's that, and it's always been that way with Affinity. I don't know why that is, but turning it off does not make a noticeable difference in the speed at which Affinity operates. And now for our message from our sponsor, who also happens to be me. Over the years I've been making the Sky Story channel, many persons have asked if I had images for sale. And now I do. Just a couple weeks ago, I created the Sky Story Gallery, and you can find it at the link below. In the gallery, I am slowly adding a selection of the very best of my images. Available as 13 by 19 or 13 by 13 images. All prices are noted in Canadian funds, which is just like getting a discount because Canadian currency is about 30% less than American currency. And if you're ordering in North America or the UK, shipping is included. All funds raised go toward the production of the channel and the maintenance of the observatory. Please note, however, that because I live deep in the backwoods, in the Canadian North, and winter is just about to set in, I will not be able to deliver during the winter months as soon as the snow flies. I can still ship now, but sometime between now and late December, the snow is going to fly and it's going to fall deep and we will literally be locked in till spring. So if you've been planning on placing an order, now is most definitely the time. And there's good odds it could get there for Christmas. All right, let's get back to it. Let's look at the application of the new affinity to another set of data. This data set is of the Crab Nebula, otherwise known as NGC 1952 or Messier 1. And it is arguably one of the most famous nebulae. And something somewhat special about this data set is that it represents 20 hours of total integration encompassing the entire visible spectrum. So it reveals a lot of detail not often captured in images of the Crab Nebula. In particular, the dustiness both within the nebula and the great deal of dust that surrounds the nebula. There's a lot of dust in the space that surrounds the Crab Nebula, but any kind of narrowband imaging seems to filter that dust out, especially the dust in the surrounding space. And it takes a considerable amount of integration and possibly extremely dark skies to reveal that very dim dust. It's as dim as any of the dimmest IFN I have ever imaged. So I've already composited the separate luminance and RGB plates into a single new layer. And I am just now beginning the next step of my typical workflow, frequency separating the new LRGB plate. 
Frequency separation works in almost the exact same way in Affinity version 3 as it did in Affinity Photo 2. The one difference being that the layer must be rasterized before you do the frequency separation. This converts the vector graphics of an image into a bitmap of a grid of pixels. And the new Affinity builds on its strengths in processing this kind of information so it insists that you do the conversion first. So any new layers that you generate in the course of editing will always be bitmap layers and you can frequency separate them directly. But if you drag a new photo into your layer stack, you'll have to take a moment to rasterize the new photo layer. And that's easy, just right click on the new layer and select the rasterization option. Once the layer is rasterized, then just go to the frequency separation tool and use it as per usual. Now the reason that I am doing frequency separation is to follow the next standard process in my workflow, which is to apply synergistic sharpening to the high frequency information where the detail is, and to apply tools like levels and curves to the low frequency information where light and color reside. Working on the information separately, divided neatly into high and low frequency layers, allows me to develop the information more completely and push the data harder to get more out of it. If I were to try doing this before separating the high and low frequency components, I would run a high risk of developing artifacts. Frequency separation avoids the artifacts entirely. And what I wanted to show you is how well the new Affinity implements its sharpening tools let me just push the unsharp mask here really high, way higher than I would normally push it in sharpening an image. There it is all the way. There's no crunchiness, no grittiness, no artifacts along the edges of the image, which one would always see with the old versions of Affinity. That's been entirely resolved, meaning that the sharpening features of Affinity now work as well as they do in some premium photo developing software, such as DxO's PhotoLab. I've noted in previous videos, for example, that when developing astrophotos in Photolab 8, no matter how hard you push the unsharp mask, you never have to go back and correct for crunchiness, and you never get artifacts along the outer edge of the image, which was a problem that occurred about 100% of the time with Affinity Photo. As much as I loved it, its unsharp mask and other sharpening tools always suffered from this weakness, and the algorithms by which these sharpening tools now function has been entirely corrected. The same applies to the Clarity tool and the High Pass filter. If I push the Clarity tool all the way to its maximum effect, we get some crunchiness, but that's because the Clarity tool is a, is a form of contrast tool. But it doesn't introduce unusual artifacts, it just makes the image over contrasted. And the High Pass filter, which is a lot like the Unsharp mask, it just focuses on sharpening a different range of information. No matter how hard I push it, I don't get artifacts out of it anymore. I get a bit of an oversharpened image, but that's to be expected. These new sharpening tools just work so incredibly well. And it is one of the many remarkable improvements to be found in the new Affinity. Let's take a look at color and light balancing in the new Affinity. In the low frequency layer, I'll open a levels tool. Now I'll push up the black level just a little bit. And even though there are very subtle differences between the brightness of the dust surrounding the Crab Nebula and the space itself, no black crushing is introduced. If I pushed up really high, there would be, but a little bit of ordinary pushing no longer crushes the blacks. Likewise, if I draw down the white level all the way down to 82%, which is quite a bit, the algorithm resists blowing out the information within the image. Now, if I pushed it way down into the histogram form, yeah, I'm sure I could blow some information out, but the algorithm affects the image much more intelligently now. Let's crank up the saturation and see what happens. I'll introduce the Vibrance tool and push up hard on the saturation slider bar. Notice, no matter how much I push the saturation, the image resists developing hypersaturated colors. Let me just push the saturation up to 100%. And look at that, the colors still look good they're not hypersaturated. You can actually blow out saturation to the point you lose detail within the color and the new affinity resists doing that. Now, if you have followed my previous videos, you know that my workflow for about a year or so has gone like this. Parentheses, my workflow changes as technology and software applications change. Close parentheses. Stack and histogram stretch and picks insights where I can also run all the exterminators. To me, that's just preparation of the information. I don't really consider that development at all. Then, do 90% of the development in Affinity, my preferred layer-based photo editor, and then do the final 10% of development in Photolab, which is ultimately just a bit better at color and light balancing, though it has the 
significant weakness that it does not work in layers. With a new affinity, I still do final touch-ups in Photolab, but really very final touch-ups. I would say I've gone from using Photolab for 10% of the final developing to 2% of the final development. In fact, I'll show you what I did to this information as I finish developing it in Photolab now. Photolab has this wonderful smart lighting feature, which does an incredible job of bringing the information concealed in darkness out of an image and allowed me to reveal all that dust surrounding the Crab Nebula without blowing out the information in the Crab Nebula itself. So, I used Photolab to accomplish exactly that. And Photolab still has slightly better color management tools. In point of fact, it has a much better implementation of the Curves tool. In fact, it has the best and most complete implementation of the Curves tool that, frankly, I've ever seen. And I was able to use it to quickly color and light balance the surrounding space. But that was it. That was all I needed Photolab for. I spent maybe five minutes working in it, and that yielded this completed image right here. This is a full visible spectrum LRGB image of the Crab Nebula shot at 1280 millimeters focal length with a C8 Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, the Celestron C8, and a combination of the extremely dark skies where my observatory is located, plus the 20 hours of broadband integration, allowed the revelation of much of the dust surrounding the Crab Nebula. And if you feel the image is a little too dusty, here it is cleaned up. And to make this version in Photolab 8, all I did was turn off the DxO smart lighting, which allows for a more typical luminance balance between the brightest and darkest areas of the image. However, of course, it loses much of the dustiness that is inherent in the area. So I guess it's just a matter of choice which version of the image you prefer. But back to the new Affinity photo, which is now just called Affinity, it is the real deal. And get this, it's now free. Canva hopes you'll get a subscription to some of their development services to augment it, but the creators of Affinity insisted that the software never go to a subscription model, and at least at this time, Canva is honoring that. I don't know if they're contractually obligated to, but they are honoring that. Now you have a tool about as powerful as Photoshop, more refined than GIMP, and I'm not knocking GIMP. GIMP is extremely good, especially for freeware but you have this incredibly powerful tool, which is far more powerful, I personally feel, than even specialized astrophoto tools like PixInsight for the development of not only astrophotography, but all manner of photography. I've used Affinity to develop ordinary photography, microscopy, macro photography, pretty much any kind of photography you can think of, it does extremely well at. And to get it, all you have to do is go to the Affinity site and download it. So, if you haven't yet made the switch to Affinity, what do you have to lose? Give it a shot. Thanks for watching, and as always, get out there and shoot the sky.